I'm excited about today's message. I'm not on a stool, so it's already a good start to the day. But I'm excited about God's Word. But Pastor Jacob just told us a few things I want to really encourage you. Next weekend is our True Love Waits conference for our young people. This is not the same old material that we used the last year or the year before. We've totally revamped. It's going to all be brand new stuff. So if you're a young person, you have a young person that's been in the past, and you think, well, they've been. They don't need to go. I'll tell you, this is going to, I've looked at the stuff. It is going to be worth being there for. So you want to make sure you get your young person there this next weekend. For the men, I know there's a lot of men that will say, I just don't want to go. I don't want to be away from the house. I like to sleep in my own bed. Here's the thing. I promise you, if you will go, you will build some friendships and some relationships that weekend. We're going to have fun. It's going to be a lot of stuff that you're not going to want to miss. So sign up March 18th and 19th for our men's retreat. So make sure you do that. But I want to jump right into the Word because we're in week number four of our series, Firm Foundation. Because as believers, if our foundation is not solid, everything else in our life is going to be shaky, Right? If the foundation of your home is not solid, it's going to affect the structure and the system above it. And everything in our life will be shaky if the firm foundation of God and His Word is not the stable of our lives. Now, as we've dug into this series, it's all about learning to hear and discern the voice of God. There's a lot of voices in the world, would you agree? A lot of things shouting at us, a lot of things trying to get our attention. And the key is, as a believer, we've got to be able to filter through all the noise and know when it's God's voice and not a distracting voice. When we know God's voice, we can better answer questions like, should I make a career change? Should I marry this person? Should, I, should we sell our home? Should we do this? Everything in life, I believe you can find the answers in God's Word to lead you and guide you. Now, a lot of times I see believers, and you know how I can tell when somebody is not in the Word hearing God's Word for themselves? It's when other people that have been in God's Word come up and try to lovingly correct you and get you back on the path, you get angry about it. When people try to use God's Word and show you, here's what the Word says, we can't do this, or here's God's Word, it says we're supposed to live this way, and we get angry or we get distanced, that shows that we're not on the foundation of God's Word. And so that's what I'm wanting to do over these next few weeks. I want to spur us on that if we're not on the solid ground of God's Word, if we don't have a daily devotion time, if we don't have a time of digging in to the Holy Bible, that I inspire you to want to do so because He's never led us astray. Amen? Now, we got to basically decide, do we want to go to church or do we want to be the church? That's, that's the deciding factor. Do we want to just come, be here, that was nice, that was wonderful, and we get the little warm, goose bumply fuzzies and everything, and then we leave and we don't go out of here changed. But we can be the church. We're called to be the church. Now, how many of you ever heard somebody say, I'm a lover, not a fighter? Anybody ever heard that? All right, so the thing is, in the Word of God, we're called to be both. We're called to love other people, but we're also called to be a fighter, to be a warrior, to fight back and to fight for our family, to fight for our church, to fight for our city, and to fight for our nation. Amen. Amen. But life is full of a a cycle of never-ending decisions that you and I have to make. How many of you have to make decisions every day? If you don't, then you're still in bed because you made a decision to get up and come to church, all right? So you have to make decisions every day. I want my decisions to be guided to make sure that I'm on the right path because I don't know about you, I hate to get lost. I am one of those typical guys that I don't stop and ask for directions. That's why I'm glad that GPS works so well. But I don't like to be lost. I don't like to not know where I'm at. And right now, today, I believe there are people sitting in this room that you don't know where you're at in life. You feel like you're wandering around just hoping you'll find the right path to lead to some sort of happiness. And I'm telling you, the Word of God is the path to everything that you're looking for. A relationship with Jesus Christ is everything that you're looking for. But I think a lot of people live with a lot of stress and fear of making the wrong decisions in life. But how freeing would it be to know that we have this internal compass of the Holy Spirit that works along with God's Word to lead us and guide us so we don't have to keep taking those dirt paths and off the wrong track in life. God wants to guide you. I mean, what if we could clearly hear God's voice? He say, that looks good, but that's not me. That looks good, but that's not me. That right there, that's me. Life can be that clear. I mean, think back to the story of Adam and Eve all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God created them, placed them right there in the middle of the garden. And from the very first moment that man and woman's feet hit planet Earth, the enemy had a strategy to separate them from God's voice. 
He knew that he was never going to be able to to gain ground. He was never going to be able to have a foothold in the life of Adam and Eve and mankind if he could not first separate them from the voice of God. So he wanted to drive a wedge. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say? He caused her to doubt God's voice and to, to doubt God's direction. Because he knew that if he could cause her to doubt and cause her to question, that he'd have a hold in her life. And I think that's what's happening right now in the life of believers. Some of us in this room, that the enemy is working overtime to separate us from God's voice. To make us too busy to get in God's word. We're not out there maybe overtly sinning and following a worldly path. But we're just not in God's word. So we're wandering aimlessly through life. God never created you and I to walk this earth without a plan. He's got a plan for your life. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you hope and give you a future. But you can't know the plan until you open the map. And the map is God's word. So he knew, Satan did, that if he was going to defeat us, he's going to have to separate us from God's voice. Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that when you eat from from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But here's the kicker. Why would Satan tell her that and why would she fall for it? Because Adam and Eve were already made in God's image. From day one, he said, I made them in my image. And that whole conversation that day was a huge look into Satan's strategy into their lives and into our lives to get us to listen to his voice over God's, to hijack the direction of our lives by getting us to listen to him versus God. So he's going to separate us from the voice of God to where we feel like the word of God is just too tedious, it's too hard to understand. You know, I don't have time to go to church and hear the word of God. And he's just wanting to get you off to the side. How many of you know if people want to tell you something that's going to be destructive, a lot of times they're going to say, psst, come here. And the devil's going, psst, come here. Come here, i got something I want to tell you. He doesn't want to tell everybody because everybody else goes, ha, don't listen to him. That's not right. The enemy's never going to tell you the lie in front of someone else who knows the truth. So he's going to make sure that he pulls you to the side, and he's going to make sure that he gets your ear, and he tells you to listen so that he can distract you. So that whole conversation was just a ploy. And he'll try to convince every one of us in this room that we need to be somebody else or something else. Because you know what he does? He attacks our identity. He attacks who you were created to be. God created you to be who you are and had a plan for who you are. And the enemy wants to come and pervert that and change our identity and get us on a different path. Because Eve was already created in God's image. And she forgot that. And why is it so easy sometimes to listen to the voice of the enemy over the voice of God? Here's what I think. I think because when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we see everything wrong with us. When we look at our lives, we see all of the negative and not the positive. We can have 95% of everything going right in our lives, and we focus on the 5% that's off. And we pick ourselves apart. And the enemy gets in your your head and he starts saying, you're dumb, you're stupid, you have no life, you have no future, you're hopeless. And so we get more familiar with the voice of the enemy because it's the same voice we've been using to talk to ourselves. And he separates us from the voice of God so that we can't find out who we really are. So many of us are sitting in this room today believing a lie that we're worthless and that we're a failure and we're never going to amount to anything. But you also were created in his image. You're already what he wants. Sure, he might change some things and tweak things, but it's always going to upgrade the model. You're his child created in the very image of Almighty God. But after mankind blew it and allowed sin to enter the world, what did Adam and Eve do? They hid. What did God do? Were you raised in church like I was, that a holy God cannot allow sin into his presence? Then why did he go running after them? Why did he go running after them? He chased them down in the garden and said, where are you? He knew where they were. He just needed them to be willing to admit where they were. I want to ask you today, are you willing to admit where you are? Are you Will you keep living in denial at the state of your life? Will you admit, I'm not where I need to be spiritually, but I want to get there. 
that I'm giving you the roadmap on how to get there today. So from that moment on, from the very moment of Adam and Eve giving in to the voice of the enemy, all from the beginning of the Old Testament, there has been a love-hate relationship between mankind and God's voice. In Exodus, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. Later, he gave him ten commandments up on the mountain in a thundering lightning display. But when Moses came down and delivered God's word to the people, do you know what the people of God said? Well, let me tell you. Exodus 20, verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. All of this was God. And they were fearing God. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will what? Die. They were listening to the same voice of the enemy that Eve and Adam listened to. I mean, do you see how well the enemy's plan is working? Man went from speaking to God directly in the garden to be afraid of his voice. From speaking to him face to face to being afraid to even hear his voice. And that's still Satan's plan today. He wants to convince every one of us that listening to God's voice is going to kill our relationships, kill our career, kill our fun. And convince you that God wants to take your life, not give you life. But God didn't pull any punches. He said, hold up, listen. Let me expose the enemy's plan for your life, and let me tell you my plan for your life. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief, who is Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life, and have it to the full. I want to ask you, how many of you want a full, abundant life? Let me see your hands. The rest of you, I can't help you. I mean, therapy maybe, but, but, something, but I want an abundant life. I want a full life. I want everything that God has for me. I don't want to leave any crumbs on the table. So eventually things got so bad that God said, you know what? I'm done. I'm through. I'm out. You don't want to hear my voice? You don't want to listen to me? Fine, I'm out. And from the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew, there was a span of 400 years of silence. God's people had 400 years without the voice of God to direct them. But when he was ready to come back, he came back in glory. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. John the Baptist shows up and he says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Then we hear in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, God left no doubt that he was ready to start speaking again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became, Jesus, became flesh, which is Jesus, and made his dwelling among us. God got you here today to tell you, I'm ready to speak if you'll listen. I'm ready to speak to your life. If you will listen to me, I will speak to you. If you will pray, I will speak. If you will read, I will speak. If you'll get into my presence and worship, I will speak. I will not be silent. And then Jesus finally launched his ministry. And the voice of God was what affirmed who he was. Matthew 3, 17. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, and him I am well pleased. But here's the thing, you're his son and you're his daughter as well. And he loves you and he's got a plan for you. He just needs you to listen to his voice so he can give you the, the 411 on what he's trying to do. I mean, can you imagine how bad Satan and the demons had to have freaked out that day? The moment that God spoke, the moment that he goes down into the water, Jesus is baptized and God speaks and they go, the voice is back. The voice from the garden is back. And we're going to lose our foothold on men and women. So it was official. God not only had his voice back, but he showed the world that he wasn't done speaking. And he was about to change the world. In fact, he was just getting started. God's voice is still very clear today if you'll just take the time to listen to him. Church, I know that we can hear the voice of God. But we've got to open up our spiritual ears and hear and learn to recognize the voice. And the way that you learn to recognize his voice is by getting in his word and listening to what he has to say. Because God's given us every believer an amazing gift, this internal compass called the Holy Spirit, the word of God to speak loudly to us so that we don't have to wonder, we don't have to be confused, but we can have discernment. Because God's voice comes to us through his word. 
that's why we've been spending the last three weeks teaching you the SOAP method. It's an acronym. If you haven't listened to the first three weeks, go back and listen to them. Scripture, we read the Bible. We observe what he was saying to the people that it was written to. We apply it to us today, and then we pray about it. There is a SOAP reading plan that looks like a bookmark back there on the table. But here's the best thing, so you can have it with you at all times. We have an, a High Point Church app, if you didn't know that. You can go to the, the app store on your, on, on your device. Go in there and type in High Point Church. Make sure you spell it right. Make sure it looks like our logo. And tap into it, and then you'll see at the bottom, it'll say Bible. You click that, and the SOAP reading plan will come up. The same exact one on that card back there. You can have it everywhere you go. And here's the coolest part about it. If you're driving, don't read and drive. You can hit play, and it will read today's scripture reading to you as you listen. Because God wants you to hear his voice. Now, we need God's voice. I wouldn't want to go into my day second-guessing what God wants me to do. I want to know what God wants me to do. And in John 6, 35, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Remember that, bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, you relate to hunger and thirst. I will, you'll never spiritually be hungry or thirsty again if you'll listen to me, because I am the bread of life. He said, I'll be your daily bread. So let's shift gears a little bit. Let me let you into the nuances of my life. I have a little bit of issues, and so I'm going to share with you my issues. I love bread. Anybody in here love bread? But I don't just love bread. I love hot, fresh bread. Come on now. When it comes out of the oven, that hot, fresh bread, and that's what we're going to look at today is about fresh bread. Because, Lord Jesus, you go to Red Lobster, and you get them little, little uh, garlic, little biscuits. They'll change your life. Then you go to Jim and Nick's barbecue, have mercy. They got, how many of you never had those? If you haven't had those, you ain't living. They give you those little corn muffins, and then you give you that, that, that honey butter, and you put it on there. I'm telling you, my eyes roll back in my head. It's that good. It is literally that good. But I think there's something else that qualifies just as much. It's not necessarily bread, but somebody said this the other day. You can't go a week about talking about it. I can't. Hot, fresh Krispy Kreme donuts. All right. I know I got issues. If you, do, if you want to go to a, a church where your pastor doesn't love Krispy Kreme, then it ain't this one. All right, but here's the thing. I don't just like Krispy Kreme. I like the hot Krispy Kreme. There's a difference in a room temperature Krispy Kreme and a hot one. When it's hot, it will melt in your mouth. I got glaze all over my steering wheel. Can't even get out of the, out of the parking lot, and I'm eating them. And I don't know what they do, but they don't open them boxes real good. I, Kelly got mad at me the other day. I ripped the lid off because I couldn't get to it fast enough. I got issues, folks. I'm working through it. See, that's just the thing. Jesus knows you got issues. He just wants you to let him help you get through it. I'm willing to let Jesus help me through it. But, man, when you've had a hot one, whoo. Did you know they got a hot light there? I mean, I know you have to know. If you can't know Krispy Kreme without a hot light. And when the hot light is on, people go crazy. You see skid marks in front. I think Krispy Kreme is the only business I've ever seen that many wrecks and skid marks in front of. Because they got that big old turbine fan on the side of the building, and it goes, woo, woo, woo. and when the hot light comes on, it starts pumping out the smell of those sweet little things. And it comes out on the street, and people go crazy. They slam on brakes. They run into each other. Doth and Eden even had to go and mess up the experience and put in curbs to make you work for getting it. I don't know who designed that, but anyway. And they even got an app. Did you know that? They got an app, and I have it set on notifications. And when the hot light in Dothan, Alabama comes on, I get notified. I may not can go. I just want to know. I just want to know what I could have if I could get there. So here's the thing. I love fresh hot bread. But God's bread is a different kind of bread. It's his word. It's fresh bread that feeds the hungry heart. I wish that we could love God's Word. I wish I could love God's Word as much as to want to just tear open the pages and get into it like I do that box of donuts. And I know that if I could be that hungry for the Word of God, we'd have revival from continent and globe. And if people can get hungry for the Word of God and create a hunger for it, we'll change the world. But God's Word is a different kind of, of bread. It's the bread of life that feeds hungry souls. And if you're sitting here today under the sound of my voice and you haven't found what you're looking for in life, if life's not fulfilling, or if it is fulfilling but you're on the wrong path, God's Word will get you on the right path. And God does not like stale bread. 
I don't know about you. I, I, I'll tell you the truth. I tried to eat a donut this morning before I left the house. We went to Krispy Kreme the other day. I know. But anyway, that thing was about three days old, and it was hard as a brick. I still ate it, but it was hard as a brick. I did not enjoy it as much as I did when it was fresh. But yet many believers resign themselves to day-old bread, trying to live off of three days ago devotion and what God spoke to them back when they were younger. And God says, I'm still making fresh bread. You don't have to settle for day old. You just got to sit at my doorway, and when the hot light clicks on, you just get in. So God urges us to get into his presence every day for fresh, hot bread. Because when it ain't fresh, when it's stale, it's hard as a hockey puck. And if it's not hard, it crumbles when you try to break it. But I want to know what God wants to say to me today, what, not, not what he tried to say three days ago. I want to know what he wants to say to me today. So every time I grab God's word and I open it up and I get my journal out and I start going through the soap method, it's like the hot light of heaven clicks on. And God says, fresh bread. And I'm like, woohoo, let's go. Teach me something, Lord. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the man who trusts in him. Daily bread, fresh bread is a huge lesson that God wants us to learn. So much so that the children of Israel, they've been delivered from slavery out of Egypt. Now they're traveling through the desert for 40 years in the, in, in, in the hot sun. And God gave them fresh daily bread called manna. Every morning it would drop down from heaven. But he had some stipulations. They couldn't store it up. They couldn't have any leftovers. It had to be gathered daily to keep it fresh. Here's the instruction that he gave to Moses to give to the people. Exodus 16:4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. They didn't even have to cook it. They didn't even have to go to get it. It came to the door of their tent every day, and the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And in this way, I will test them and see whether they're following my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So in other words, six days a week, they could not have any leftovers. You couldn't save for today what you didn't eat for tomorrow. But on the sixth day, on Sabbath, they were able to gather double because they weren't allowed to work and even gather food on the Sabbath. So there was only one out of the seven days they were allowed to have leftovers. The other six days, they couldn't. But the Israelites were stubborn, and they still wanted to do things God's way. Even though they knew what God had said, they still thought they knew better. Exodus 16, 20. So God says, okay, you want to try to hide it in your tent? Act like you ain't got no leftovers? However, some of them paid no attention to Moses, and they kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Their disobedience reeked. It literally stunk. They couldn't hide it. It was obvious to everybody. Every time you walked by somebody's tent, you could just smell the aroma of stench, of someone living off of yesterday's provision. And I don't care how good we are. As believers, it will show in our lives because our attitudes will stink. Our choices and decisions will start to stink because we're living off of yesterday's word. And God wants you to give a fresh word right from the oven of heaven. Matthew 6, 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. Not weekly. Most Christians, they say nowadays, only come to church twice a month. God does not give bi-monthly bread. He gives daily bread. So what does that mean? I'm not with you every day. So what does that tell you? If you come every Sunday, you're going to get bread from me four times, maybe five on certain months. But the other six days of the week, you're to go and stand at the doors of heaven with your Bible and get daily bread for yourself. Another re reason, why do we need fresh bread? Because we have a tendency to drift. As believers, we all have a tendency to drift. And God's word has the power to over counter and, and overcome the drift in our lives. Hebrews 2.1 says we must pay careful attention, focus, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not what? Drift away. In other words, don't just read your Bible. You ever read your Bible and when you got through, you were like, I read it. Well, what did it say? I don't know. Because you read it, but you didn't digest it. You didn't carefully read it. You didn't pay careful attention. So how do we avoid the drift? By daily submitting ourselves to the voice of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to correct us. And he will often speak to us through the word of God and give us instruction. 
So we got to stand daily at the hot light of heaven and saying, God, I need fresh word from you today. I need to hear your voice. Proverbs 8.34 says, Blessed are those who listen to me watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. Now, I don't want to belabor the point and make you think I have a bigger issue than what I really do. I do have an issue. But it reminds me of the days where I would stand there at the glass at Krispy Kreme and watch those donuts on the conveyor belt. I mean, I would sit there and watch, and there was like, and they would grab that little clear stick, and they would put it in the box, and I'm like, "Eh." and you get so excited. Maybe I'm the only one. But I would sit there with a sense of anticipation. I know some of you are like, dude, he needs help. I do. But there was a sense of anticipation of that I can't wait. And I have been praying since we started this series. I love God's word. But God, give me that kind of hunger to where I can't wait. Again, every single one of us drift a little bit because we're human. We still live in this earth suit called a body. But God has given us mentors of the Bible, Paul and and Silas and Daniel and Peter and others to look and learn from their lives. And if we slip a little bit today and we get into God's word tomorrow, It's a lot easier to make it just a little shift and a little correction because you've only been off the path for a short while. But when you close your word and you're not in God's presence for two, three, four, five days, weeks, or even months, when you do get God back in God's presence and he shows you the direction, you realize you're way further off path than what you realized. And it can be discouraging. But here's the thing. God can get you back on his path very quickly. You just got to give him your ear. You got to give him your ear. But I don't want to have to make a huge course direction. I don't want to have made. Some of you right now, you're making the decision of your career. You're making the decisions of a move. You're making the decisions of who you're going to marry. You're making the decisions of who you're about to divorce. Who you're about to hook up with at the office and hope your spouse doesn't find out about it. You're about to make those directions and you're going to get so off course that when you do come to your senses and find the direction of God, you're going to feel like there's no way back. That's why you've got to stay in God's word. And how does God create a hunger in your coworkers, in your family? How do you make somebody hungry? I tell you this all the time. How do you make somebody hungry? Eat in front of them. Shiloh, may I have my prize. Did you think I was going to talk about it and not have them here with me? Y'all really do not know me. So here's the thing. Any of you fellas on the front row, you want a donut? Come get you a donut. Come on, move quick. The doors of heaven are about to close. Come on. All right. So here's the thing. Stand up, turn around, and eat it. Come on, let them see you. How many of you want a donut? All right. So we do have donuts for everybody out there under the white tent outside. But only these four get to eat they're the only four happy people in the room besides me (laughs) but isn't that how you feel sometimes in church you're sitting there worshiping and you don't feel a thing meanwhile the person next to you like they got a whole hot like Krispy Kreme donut in their hand and they're sitting there worshiping the Lord and they're in the presence of God and you're like where's my donut And God says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. you got to quit looking at your issues, look at your situation, quit looking at your situation and where you're at and how long it's been and just get in his presence and the hot light will click on. Because there's a big difference in reading the Bible and getting into the Bible. Reading the Bible tells you history and facts. Getting into the Bible is like following Jesus himself. It's like a one-on-one conversation. He's not just giving you words of instruction. He's giving you a one-on-one face-to-face conversation. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's living and breathing without error. And when you do it, you'll get the wisdom of the ages. And you'll find what you need to navigate life. Because wisdom isn't gathered in a day. But it is gathered daily. There's an easy way to remember everything that God teaches you in the Word. Just get into His Word daily. Let it get into your head. When it gets into your head, and then it gets into your heart, and then it gets into your life. That's information becomes inspiration that becomes transformation. Let me break it down for you. But if you only go to phase one when it only gets in your head, that's called information. 
And you know what information will do? If you don't go any further, it makes you a Pharisee. You become religious. You think you know more than everybody else. You can quote scripture with ease. But God wants it to go further than your head. Because when it gets into your heart and you get excited about it, it becomes inspiration. But if you stop there, if you're only inspired and you get the warm goosebump fuzzies, inspiration alone will take you from a Pharisee to a fanatic. Because it becomes all about feelings and Holy Ghost goosebumps. And that's not enough. You've got to have inspiration to change. There's a lot of people that come to church, get excited, get their woo-woo on. But they leave here and they don't change. And that's just inspiration for the moment. But when it pours out of your life, that's transformation. And when you're transformed, that makes you a disciple. It becomes a part of who you are, a follower of Christ. And it's when believers become transformed and become like Christ that we change the world. Because we live in a world that's all about themselves. Everybody look out for number one, dog eat dog. But when we're transformed, we die to self. It's no longer about me. It's about Jesus and then everybody else. And that's when you become authentic and that's when you become real. And here's what I've found. When I focus on Jesus and I focus on others, he takes care of me. But when I take care of me, I take on the burden of upkeeping what I should have surrendered to God, which is my life. I mean, let's look at it this way. Everybody knows what a rumble strip is on the highway, right? If you've got your driver's license. What does a rumble strip do? Give you a heart attack because you just about fell asleep and you get on the side of the road and it goes, and it wakes you up real quick and you jolt. Well, that's what God's word is. When you spiritually fall asleep and you start drifting, the Holy Spirit and God's word will start going, and you know that you're off path. But if you choose to ignore the rumble strips and just act like they're not there, the guardrails will get your attention. You don't listen to the rumble strips. Oh, the guardrails speak loud and clear, and they won't give you an option because you might go over the cliff. And daily moments in God's Word creates those rumble strips in our heart that when the enemy of the voice, the voice of the enemy tries to separate us from God, that inner voice of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God that you've allowed to be planted in your heart starts going, bup, 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 and you realize something's off, and you feel that tugging. And you feel that rumble. Sailors used to have an old saying. They'd say, he who won't be ruled by the rudder will be ruled by the rocks. You know what that means? If you won't listen to the warnings of the Holy Spirit, you're surely going to encounter some disaster on the rocks. That rudder keeps you going in the right direction. You can steer. And when you don't steer on the path that God has given you through his word, you're going to end up on the rocks. Because God's word is that rudder that transforms our life and gives direction. Wow, Pastor Derek. Rumble strips and guardrails. That sounds very constricting. Sounds very restrictive. That doesn't sound like fun. Neither does going over the side of a cliff. Neither does running off the road and hitting a tree. Those rumble strips and guardrails aren't there to spoil your fun. They're to protect your life. And where do you get them? God's Word. To help you navigate the paths of life. That's why God gave us the mentors of the Bible. I mean, Joseph had to flee Potiphar's wife, so he had to, uh, to, to handle and deal with and knew the pull of lust. Abigail had to deal with David's pinting anger, all the while dealing with her own frustration and encouragement. You need to get familiar with Abigail. And Peter was left so discouraged that he left, fish, left, left his call from God to go back to fishing. So he knew the feeling of giving up and throwing in the towel. So how do you develop the rumble strips of spirituality in your life? By getting in God's word. Getting into the daily bread of the word of God. I can't do it for you. You can come to church and I can treat you like a toddler and go, here comes the airplane. Ooh, open up. I can do that if you want to, but you're never going to grow. I don't know about you, but I'd like to have a steak every once in a while. I'd like to have some meat and I'd like to have some potatoes and something starchy and good. And you can learn to get it yourself. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and of sober mind. In other words, pay attention. The enemy, your devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking for his next victim to be on his menu. 
because he's out to defeat you. And if you lose your alertness, if you get sidetracked or off path, if you doze off spiritually, if you don't hear those rumble strips, that's when you get in trouble. So I want to ask you, do you want God's spirit to move in your life? Do you want to know that you're on the right path? Do you want to know that what you're doing is what God is leading you to do? You've got to open his word every day. Because the hot light of, of heaven comes on every day without fail. And it's available 24 hours a day, not just at certain times. Because your life literally depends on it. And you'll get a fresh word from the baker himself. Bow your heads. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Derek, that's me. I'm off path. I've ignored the rumble strips. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The greatest tragedy today would be to continue to ignore the rumble strips and end up on the rocks. So I want to pray for you. Father, I pray today that you would help us to feel the presence of your spirit, to know and hear your word, and to get back on path. Lord, I thank you that you do not leave us stranded, but you have a plan. Father, help us to not be afraid of what we might see in ourselves when we look in the mirror of your word. But help us to know you will not show us anything that you do not give us the grace and the strength to work on. And you love us regardless. Now with your head still bowed, if you're here and you say, Pastor Eric, I don't know Jesus. I don't know if I died today, if I'd go to heaven or not. I don't have a relationship. with. I want him to forgive my sins. I want the relationship you've been talking about. If that is you, then my friend, I can introduce you to him right now. You can invite him to come into your heart. You don't have to clean up your act. You don't have to get rid of all your mess. Jesus will help you. But if that's you, you say, Pastor Derek, I want Jesus in my life, then I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me and everybody else in the room. So let's pray it together. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I give you my life. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.